Welcome to the Makeup Artists and Hairstylists Symposium. My name is Leonard Engelman. I am the uh, Makeup Artists and Hairstylists Branch Chairman. Catherine Blondell is the Vice Chairman, and Lois Burwell is our third governor. The nominated films this year are wonderful examples of the very vast range that is the art of makeup and hairstyling, and the vast range of selection process within the makeup artists and hairstylist branch. We have Border, Mary Queen of Scots, Vice. <clears throat> Today's nominees are Yuren Lundstrom, Pamela Goldheimer, Jenny Shirkor, Mark Pilcher, Jessica Brooks, Greg Canham, Kate Bisco, and Patty Dehaney. Would all of our nominees please stand? Let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you. We have a number of people in the audience I would also like to recognize. Oscar's past recipients and nominees. We have Bill Corso. You, if you would stand and just remain standing. Michelle Burke, Kevin Haney, Greg Canham, Barbara Lorenz, Deborah Lamia Denever, Howard Berger, Lois Burwell, V. Neal, Trevor Proud, Gail Ryan, Tammy Lane, Robert Pandini, Christina Smith, Martin Samuel, Robert Short, Jenny Shurkor. And I would also like to recognize from the Makeup Artists and Hairstylists uh, Guild, Local 706, Business Representative Randy Sayer, <laughs> Assistant Business Representatives Polly Luck and Pat Patrice Madrigal, and President Julie Sokash. I also would like to thank the Academies, Randy Haberkamp and Rose Wilson, and the team that they have for all the work and coordination in making this function take place. And Tom Oyer and uh, Michael Benedict uh, for all of the help throughout the entire year uh, for our branch. This story has been told uh, before, but we feel it's important. In 1968, prior to there being a yearly Oscar for makeup, Planet of the Apes was going to receive a special Academy Award. This was, there was to be one statue. The award, as was the process of the times, would have gone to the makeup department head of 20th Century Fox, Dan Striebeck. Dan said the person most responsible for this achievement is John Chambers, and he must receive the Oscar. It is that standard of honesty and responsibility that we follow today as the committee painstakingly chooses the individuals most responsible for what has been recognized in each film. A few weeks ago, the great, great dance, the great Dan Strepek passed away, but he will always be remembered not only for his honesty but also for his artistry. This is a wonderful time for these eight nominees to bask in their accomplishments and recognition. Some of you in the audience may have contributed to these films and should be sharing in that glory. So audience, enjoy the time, applaud, make noise, celebrate with these nominees because that's what this is all about and let's start right now. Please welcome Catherine Blondell. Today is a celebration of winners. Every nominee that steps on the stage is a winner. One group will carry away a statue, but every nominee is a winner. <clears throat> the reason the Academy gives Academy Awards is to honor and celebrate the art and science of the motion picture. It's why the Academy exists. The Oscar exists because the founders believed that movies were not just a business and people needed to be reminded of that. 
The Oscar exists to tell the world that filmmaking is an art and it is being practiced by some people at a very high level. And some of those people are in this room today. Before we hear from our Oscar nominees, I would like to explain the process that brought us here today. In April and October, the makeup artist and hairstylist executive branch meet. As a part of the business, they discuss the films that have been released during the previous months. There are films these members feel should be seen for makeup and hairstyling, and a list is sent to all branch members so they can be aware of them. We also encourage members to post on our website any picture they feel should be seen. In November, all branch members are asked to attend a meeting to discuss the list of released films and encourage uh, that if they have a film that is a late release, to ask their producers to have screenings so their film can be considered. This list is also posted along with possible new releases. Then in December, there is another all branch meeting to go through the list and to vote for the seven films that will go forward for consideration for the nomination. These are selected as the seven best films for achievement in makeup and hairstyling for this year. We like to point out how unbiased these selections are as I read out the name of the seven films the members chose. All seven great accomplishments in our, the artistry of makeup and hairstyling. Black Panther, makeup and hairstyling of the film as a whole. Bohemian Rhapsody, makeup and hairstyling of the film as a whole. Border, makeup and hairstyling for the Vor and Tina characters. Mary, Queen of Scots, makeup and hairstyling for the whole film. Stan and Ollie, makeup and hairstyling for Stan and Ollie characters. Suspiria, makeup and hairstyling for the Dr. Joseph Klimper and Helena Marcos characters. Vice, makeup and hairstyling for the film as a whole. Of 18 possible nominees, seven were not Academy members, 12 were not IATSE Local 706 members, four have Oscars, and five have Oscar nominations. Please welcome Lois Burwell. <sighs> well, the selection of these films and their possible nominees is complex for we recognize the specific makeup and hairstyling achievements in a film. In some cases, this may be the film in its entirety, for makeup, or for hairstyling, or for makeup and hairstyling. Or it may be for a specific character or characters for makeup, or makeup and hairstyling. From that decision, we recognize the artist or artist most responsible for those achievements. Following that December meeting, the Makeup Artists and Hairstylists Executive Committee meets. This is probably the most difficult of the meetings because the committee now has to choose a maximum of two names and in an exceptional circumstance, possibly three, of those most responsible for the look of each film or character and characters. It doesn't matter how much was spent on advertising. It doesn't matter what someone has in their deal memo. Extensive research is collated to ensure that the executive committee makes the decision based on input and the work that was done. Then in January, all members were asked to attend a presentation by the makeup artists and hairstylists recognized for the seven films. This is often referred to as the Bake Off. There are no baked goods, and I still don't know the answer to why it's the Bake Off. This is when the final nominations were chosen for the Academy Award for Makeup and Hairstyling for 2018. 
As you can see, the makeup artists and hairstylists academy members spend a tremendous amount of unselfish time in an effort to applaud the work of others. Today you are going to see how that process takes place. We are going to ask each of the nominees to talk about some of the work that took place and what, um, and what, it, and what it is you will see in the film clips they represent. We will then show the 10 minute clip so you can see that wonderful work. After the third clip has been seen, we will open the floor for your questions of the nominees, followed by an opportunity to join the nominees and see the marvelous displays representing their films downstairs in the lobby. So, now let's meet our nominees. Our first nominated film is Border. Please welcome Joran Lundström, Joran, please come up and take a seat on the stage. Joran is credited as makeup and prosthetics designer, and this is his first Oscar nomination. And please welcome Pamela Godhammer. Pamela is cre credited as on-set makeup effects and prosthetic supervisor. This is the first Oscar nomination for Pamela. Well, congratulations Thank on you. wonderful, marvellous work. I think we can all agree with that. So, let's begin. Um, well, these are extraordinary characters. So, I'd like to ask you what the inspiration was and the design. Well, um, let me see where to start. Um, I got a phone call from the production asking me to do makeups for trolls for this drama, and it could only take like one hour to do the makeup every day. <laughs> and um, so basically, like my thinking was, oh well, I can do like a forehead or whatever. But then I met, uh, I got a chance to speak to the director Ali Abassi um, about what he wanted, and he told me, you know, we had some ideas, and he showed me a sketch of a Neanderthal. And as a makeup artist, um, if I'm going to do a troll, it's really good to know what the director wants. But then I need to put my take on what a, um, what a troll should be. And Neanderthals look very specific, in a sense. I, I tried to do something that, that would be what Ali wanted, but not a Neanderthal. So basically, the script says that the character of Tina um, is supposed to look very odd, but still uh, well, normal looking to fit in into the reality. Um, so what I had to do is like look at the actors. So we had Eva and Eero uh, Milanov and Eva Menander and look at how different they were and try to make them more similar looking. And Eero has a very strong face, very strong characters, and it's kind of right. hard to tone that down. So what I did, I tried to make Eva look more like Eero, but not a Neanderthal. And also, uh, there's a gender swap thing in the whole film as well, where uh, she's actually the male and he's the female. Well, I was actually going to ask a question of, um, with Aero Milanov, the Vore character, mm -hmm. he's distinctly male on the outside, the outside yeah. without spoiling the plot for those people who are yet to enjoy Border. Um, so, could you share details of his makeup design and the application? Well, the makeup design for, for Eero kind of came in second because uh, we kind of needed to, to get the look for, for Eero first. And like I said, he's got very strong features as it is. So basically, I just try to make him look less human, but not really change him that much. Like with Eero, we did a lot of changes. You know, she changed her, her whole, you know, whole face. Um, uh, when it came to the gender thing, um, we didn't really think about the face as much. I think that came with Martin Jacobson's stuff that he did for the body. You know, there was stuff there that that yes. did the gender swap more. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. The giggles come from those who have seen the film. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Pamela, just for the for the for the application. Mm -hmm. So um, he has a forehead piece, cheeks, nose. He didn't have eyelids as she did. They had the ear tips. And they had teeth, a set of teeth each. And um, I placed a kind of a skin flap underneath <laughs> the wig, so that because the wigs were quite thin. Um, so with uh, 
we could see the skin through, so that was quite important. Um, and that at some point we'll talk about contact lenses and um, just really just before we started shooting, um, the decision was not to use them because it would just take them too far away from be getting away with still sort of being acceptable as humans. It made them look a bit too animalistic. And, and that's, yeah, that's his makeup. Well, that's wonderful. And I believe we have a very special guest with us today. We have Eva Melanda, who plays Tina. Eva, would you come to the stage, please? <laughs> Well, I think we can all agree that there's the transformation. <laughs> if anyone wanted an explanation. Wonderful. Thank you for a wonderful performance, too. May I say? Thank, thank you. It's really exceptional. So, um, talking about the makeup, obviously now we have the three component parts for the character of Tina. So, how was it? How was it to sit in the chair every day? Wow. Well. You have to learn how to meditate. <laughs> <laughs> how to put your focus like far away in another room somewhere and going there. Because, I mean, you have to be patient. You have to work on that a lot. Because um, I felt like I, I can't afford to, because after that, hours of makeup, I was going to shoot for 10 hours. So I couldn't afford to have like big strong feelings about this tough situation. So actually, I, I had to meditate myself into different places. You cannot read or watch a film or do some studies in the manuscripts. You, yeah, I tr tried to learn how to be a Buddhist monk. <laughs> uh, well done. So, so when you first met Eva, mm -hmm. how much of the original design that you had in your head did you adapt? and change for Eva? Well, we did the test makeup first just to show Ali something. He wanted to see something on her. Right. He didn't really want to do photoshops. So I really needed to do s some sort of makeup on her, and which I didn't really feel pre prepared for. But what I did, uh, I, I tried to find a reference, some, something to look at instead of just making it up. And, and I find that's a British actor called Eddie Marson. And I kind of looked at his face just to get some sort of reference because <laughs> it's really it's really easy to end up in, in fantasy yes. you know, fantasy makeup, and I wanted to, to ground it into real face. Yeah, good. So I figured if I if I used his face as a reference, so the first makeup we did looked a lot more like him. But then from then on we did we did a, a resculpt, a complete resculpt, and I basically just changed the nose I think mainly you know, uh, to make it look less like him. Right. So, um, Some of us were giggling because we've worked with Eddie. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, and and you, can, you can actually see some of it once you know who... Yeah. You know, it's amazing. That. Um, so, being in the chair every day and being on the set every day, what was the most difficult uh, day shooting from a makeup perspective and a performance perspective? And were they both the same? Performance perspective, I would say that um, I do play this character which has kind of buried all her feelings inside of her and she can't really, because of her look, she can't afford to have big expressions in her face because people will get scared because of her teeth and how she looks. So the big challenge, one of the big challenges for me with, with the makeup was to to deliver those very strong feelings from inside, but without using too, too big expressions. And I mean, normally I just have it in my face, those small muscles and, you know, but here I had to like really push like the specific feelings through the layers of prosthetics. And that, that was a challenge, yes. And for you, Pamela? So I think for us it was the days that were either like macro shots, like really like literally scanning the face really close, which was the idea to bring across strong emotions. Um, and um, so we would, obviously we have such a tight schedule, so we would do these macro shots sometimes after she's been rolling on the floor or um, running up and down, chasing a fox, 
Um, or, you know, we've done scenes in the forest in the very cold, with very little clothes on, half naked, it's a cold day, right? Or swimming in the water, so then, you know, sort of different challenges, but um, I think it was just the time, you know, it was just the time, because it was just little time, otherwise it's sort of, you know, sort of the usual challenges. Yes, yes. And of course, you'd be working on on the makeup throughout the day, so in a way, sometimes you must have. Didn't didn't you tell me that you were quite looking forward to close-ups towards the end of the day rather than at the beginning? Sometimes it felt like that because I felt like in the morning it wasn't enough time to get the makeup done. In the day, often we didn't have time, and I was just sort of trying sort of to catch up all day. And then sometimes I felt at the end of the day, ah, oh, yeah, now it's good. <laughs> <laughs> got there, got there in the end. So so I have another question about working collaboratively together. So um, there's always going to be the question of worms that comes up sooner or later in any Q and A. Now, were they uh, were they an effect? Were they real? How did that work? They were real, but they were hygienic, so you could eat them, and <laughs> protein source might be our future, so I've done some practice now. <laughs> but um, there is actually, actually one worm in the film which was not supposed to be in my mouth, but uh, it was just lined up in front of me, and like we just shot this picture, and I just felt like, oh, this is the best worm. I'll just, you know, I'll just, uh, I just have to do it. So I'm very happy we got that in the film. <laughs> <laughs> but I just, you know, there's, uh, it's acting. I didn't eat exactly. that one. No, I just pretended. So my question is, did you share them with the makeup department or keep them for yourself? <laughs> mm, I kept them for myself, <laughs> <laughs> though they didn't ask for any. <laughs> so I know that there were multiple pieces, but um, was it, w was it your own upper lip, Eva? Was that? No, actually not. The the upper lip. Oh yes, yes. The upper lip. The the upper lip was the only part of my face which was my own. Even the eyelids, as you said before, were covered with prosthetics. So and it was very special since I do this character also that the sense of smell is her superpower, and I couldn't move the mo nose. So I had to start working with using those muscles under the nose to push it up. And also, Ali was Abasi was talking about how horses and dogs they have uh, an organ of smell under the upper lip, and I started to watch sniffer dogs on YouTube because that's basically her job, costume officer, <laughs> and with this specific smell sense of smell. So I just scanned all these YouTube clips with with the sniffer dogs and how you know how the nose and the lip actually go together in one movement, and that's how I worked, yes. Well, thank you. So thank you very much. Um, if you'd like to take your seats now, and then we're going to show a, a 10 minute clip reel of Border and the wonderful work, but thank you so much. That was thank fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Är Roland? Mm. Som vanligt. De var på hundutställning förra veckan i Umeå. Men hur har ni det? Ja, men det är bra. Det är... Som vanligt. Som vanligt, som vanligt. Men ligger ni med varandra? Det tänker jag inte prata med dig om. Flickan min. Jag vill bara att du ska bli utnyttjad. Det är ditt hus. 
Jag tycker bara det är skönt att ha någon som bor där. Jag tror inte riktigt på sånt. Man vill att det ska vara sant. Det hade varit kul, men... Men... När jag var liten trodde jag att jag var något speciellt. Jag hade en massa olika idéer om mig själv. Mm. Men sen blev jag vuxen och fattade att jag är bara människa. Hur låg konstig människa med kromosomfel? Kromosomfel? Det är väl inget väl på dig? Det handlar om... ...här nere. Bland annat. De säger att det är ganska ovanligt. Om du är annorlunda än andra så är det för att du är bättre än dem. Du behöver inte säga så. Jag kan inte få barn. Du ska inte lyssna på mycket på vad människor säger. Hela mitt liv jag har känt mig ful och missbildad. Du, du, du förstår jag ingenting. De har mobbat mig så länge jag kan minnas. Och du sa ingenting. Jag ska vara snäll mot den. Du är inte snäll. Du är arg och elak. Jag tycker inte om dig! Lyssna på mig. Ja, jag ska lyssna om du använder den snälla tonen. Inte den arga tonen. Pappa! Pappa! Pappa är inte det! Pappa är inte också död! Det är inte besökstid nu. Det är ni stör de andra vårdtagarna. Hon är inte snäll. Vilka är mina riktiga föräldrar? Du kan komma tillbaka till morgon kanske. Pappa, var är de? Pappa, fly inte! Fly inte! Nu ska du sova lite grann och så blir det Pappa. kaffe. Så får jag be dig att gå nu. Pappa! Det går bra att komma imorgon. Kommer de här barnen ifrån? Mm. Vet inte. Det ljuger. Det ljuger. 
Det är rädd för någon. Känner du någonting? Ja. Nej. Welcome for Mary Queen of Scots, Jenny Shurko. Jenny is credi credited as hair and makeup designer. This is the third Oscar nomination for Jenny. She won f an Oscar for Elizabeth. Would you join us, please? And please welcome Mark Pilcher. Mark is credited as principal hair artist. This is the first Oscar nomination for Mark. Please join us. And please welcome Jessica Brooks. Jessica is credited as pr principal makeup artist. This is the first Oscar nomination for Jessica. Congratulations on your beautiful work. Jenny, uh, make, as makeup and hair designer, how did you uh, approach during, doing a historical movie about two very complicated women, uh, two well-known queens, and all the people that surrounded them? Well, the easy answer to that would be with fear and trepidation. <laughs> But once that initial feeling passes, I think excitement, enthusiasm, energy took over to, for me, to having done the film Elizabeth and this being of the same period, to try and breathe new life into, into Elizabeth, into, into the whole period, into the Tudor dynasty. And with that in mind, I could then focus on a design for both the queens, both, both queens, both the two most powerful women in Europe at the time. Um, and what I wanted to do more than anything was to tell their individual stories through hair and makeup. And the script lent itself to that because we could actually scene by scene, working closely with the script, interpret their, their emotions, their loves, their losses, their sadnesses, their victories, their, their defeats, all of that. And that's why perhaps in each scene, both Mary and Elizabeth have a different look because they, they go through so much. Um, there were difficulties for me in doing that because having done Elizabeth before, I wanted to change it, change the look, not just repeat myself. And Alex Byrne, the costume designer, she convinced me to do the film because she said, who also, she'd also did Elizabeth, she convinced me to do it because she said, we're going to change it, we're going to make it more modern, we're going to do it completely differently. So I believed her and went along with it. Um, and yes, I think we have done it completely differently. Uh, through, mainly I think, through the journey Elizabeth takes. Because 
this, uh, the story of Elizabeth has been done so often. Um, and it always ends up, it has to end up with the iconic portraiture that we all know about Elizabeth. And I didn't want to take the same journey to that portrait as I had done before. So we changed it through Elizabeth's journey and through Mary's, Mary's look and Mary's hairstyles because you never really saw Mary Queen of Scots without her headdress on. So you never really saw her hair. So I imagined a Mary Queen of Scots without her headdress on and devised these frames that we used to create our hairstyles. Um, and I think they had a great effect. They were simple to use and the effect was good. Um, and with Elizabeth taking her on her journey, um, in this story, she has smallpox. So in the first Elizabeth, we got to that iconic portrait by showing her as a virgin married to England, uh, none like, so she cuts her hair off and wears the wig. But in this journey, we got to that portrait by um, smallpox, the journey of smallpox, the boils and blisters and the scarring that it left. And quite a eureka moment for me was to, makeup wise, was to think that not just boils and blisters and scarring, but the placing of those boils and blisters because transforming Margot Robbie was, <laughs> when I heard that she, she was cast as Elizabeth, I, I didn't know whether to laugh or cry because I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know how we were gonna get her there. But eventually when I did realize that using the, the uh, boils and blisters in the placing of those boils on her mouth, on her eyes, etc., you could then cover those areas with makeup, like anybody would, you know, you've got a spot, you cover it with makeup. Um, so that is what carried us through to being able to transform Margot and get her to that iconic portrait. Uh, would you say Margot was your uh, biggest challenge? Well, I guess she was. She was, yes, getting her through to that point. Yes, she was. Te technically, but also in the film, uh, the director was very adamant about how each woman, how we told the story about each woman, if one was up, the other was down. So you had to be aware all the time of the two stories running alongside each other. Um, and to tell that story with the way they looked, hair and makeup. Right. Great. How big was your team? My team, we had, we have a mate. We work quite differently in England, or we can work differently. We don't necessarily separate hair and makeup. We have one team. There are those who like to separate it, but Mark is a hairdresser, but he also loves doing a bit of makeup, don't you? And then we have uh, makeup in the team who also like doing some hair. So I use the various strengths to what people do. And I think in the main team we had six of us and then there was another team who dealt with, we dealt with the principals and then the other team there were um, four who dealt with all the other what we call day players and then there was the crowd supervisor who dealt with the dirt and the soldiers and stuff like that. <laughs> Great, it was really good. Uh, Jessica? Um, how many prosthetics sorry, did uh, Margot Robbie as Queen Elizabeth wear for the different stages? Um, she had a nose throughout, um, and then for the different stages, she had two stages of smallpox, one that was more severe. So she had cheeks on for that, um, silicon cheeks, and backs of hands, and um, some pro bondo pustules, again. Um, and then for the scarring stages, she had the silicon cheeks, a bald cap, um, bondos, and then for the last stages, we blocked out her eyebrows with blockers and also eye bags as well. Fantastic, it was quite good. Uh, how long was the uh, process to get her um, through this? 
For the scarring stages and the smallpox stages, we had, I think, just over two hours. Um, yeah, so it was a lot to do. A lot to do in a small amount of time <laughs> there. Mark, um, would you talk about the two queens looks and any problems or discoveries you had? Um, <coughs> main problems were time factors because there were certain days each queen could have three or four looks and the ADs never want you to take longer than a certain period of time. And a lot of the time, Jenny, would, we would formulate those looks on them, um, <coughs> two or three frames to, to show the journey that they're going through of that, that particular part of the film. Um, so time factor was the main, the main thing and also the, the Scottish mountains, you know, wind, rain, stuff like that is not, not particularly good <laughs> with <laughs> hair and frames. So yes, that was the, ma the, main, the main difficult factors, yeah. Uh, so being a period movie, there must have been an awful lot of wigs. Um, did you have a uh, certain group that you uh, had working with those wigs to keep them up? No, um, well, we all work as a team, but I, I, I sold, would do the, the, the wigs. Margot had 10 wigs, um, Saoirse had two plus all the frames that had to be worked on regularly throughout the day, yeah, so, yeah. Those frames were quite interesting. I saw that on mm. your table, and I thought that was quite good. Really interesting idea. Well, I think they, prob they probably did use some sort of stuffing or frames, but also it was so that we would get maximum effect from minimum effort, really. Once the frames were made, they, mm. were, they were dressed with the hair, they were prepared, so they were virtually her, her crowns, weren't they? Yeah. We could use one or two, or I don't think we ever went to three. No. No, but they were, they were a godsend, really, weren't they? Beautiful work, all of you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to show you a clip. Thank you. In Aklakwanarum Valley. Madam, your cousin has returned from France. Her protector is Lord Bothwell, an able soldier. So, she comes ready for war. She may well depart once married, but I cannot profess to know her purpose. What do you see, Bess? Charming. Young. Clever. Confident. She would have no trouble securing her husband. You would not have me. Nor would I have a commoner be king. Were we not in need of an heir? I have her trust. You have her affections. You can succeed where Good I Good morning, can... William. Madam. Robert. Resplendent. Would you? Your queen is in Scotland now. When my beloved Francois passed to God, I could have married any number of suitors. Portugal, Denmark, Sweden. I declined them all. May I sit, madam? No. You may remove yourself from this council and my court.
marry the beautiful Queen of Scots and we can control her. With Mary, you too become a prince. If I'm noble enough for one queen, I am noble enough for another. Elizabeth. England is not Scotland. Do you think it might stand with my honor to marry my sister's subject? Surely there can be no greater honor than to match yourself with a nobleman by whom you inherit such a kingdom as England. I have such inheritance by blood. You may tell my sister that we pray for swift peace, that we may meet soon. I will tell her at once. Stay with us tonight at Holyrood. I'm certain Mistress Beaton would welcome your company. While we wish you a long and healthy life, and that no injury or illness befall you. Ow! 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 Refuse her what I myself suggested. We have visitors. <laughs> they are stewards. Without a treaty signed, this union strengthens her claim. You need not condescend, we are well informed. Uh, before God, before all of Scotland, before all the world. Yes. You'll be my queen? Yes. Now you're king? Yes. And your master? My husband. and too hard, with too much bloodshed, to secure peace. This world is a brutal place. We men must be wiser, mustn't we? By the pleasure and will of God, we proclaim complete the bond of marriage between our sovereign Mary, Queen of Scotland, and the noble Prince Henry Lord. Darling. What will you do now? We must take up arms with our defender, Lord Mori. We must make civil war with this false queen. We must make plain war against all false professors of Christ's holy gospel. <laughs> A word. Good. Because our swords are not just for show. With heaven's blessing, we bring another Stuart into this world. Heir to Scotland and to England. Am I to be imprisoned here alone or may I have the company of my gentlewomen? 
You may not, madam. You are to remain in this chamber. Then at least let my husband remain. They will take your crime as well as mine. Burn it. I shall begin again. If you grant her succession, we are rewarding her disobedience. What disobedience? She is not our subject. England does not look so different from Scotland. Aye, they are sisters. You're inferior. I am a Stuart, which gives me greater claim to England than you possess. I had this made because I wanted to present the best version of myself. in every way. Has Henry killed your mother? I am not my father. But you share his blood. My life exists only in my mind as both a prayer. Believe me when I tell you how it ages me to bear such a burden. Stuart is condemned to death. And we shall have peace. Our next film is Vice. Uh, please welcome to the stage Kate Bisco. Kate is credited as the department head makeup. This is the first Oscar nomination for Kate. And please welcome Patricia Dehaney. <laughs> Patricia is credited as the department head here, and this is the first Oscar nomination for Patricia. And please welcome Greg Canham. <laughs> Greg is credited as a special makeup design created and applied by. This is the 10th Oscar nomination for Greg Canham. Greg won Oscars for The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, Mrs. Doubtfire, and Dracula. Greg also won a Technical Achievement Award for development of special modified silicone material for makeup application in motion pictures. Vice was also nominated for a BAFTA Award this year. Well, I have to start this off with a quote. Uh, if you saw the Golden Globes, you saw, um, you saw Christian Bale come up and accept his award. And I was watching it, and as he came up, I went, oh my God, I forgot what Christian Bale looked like <laughs> because I had only seen him for so long as Dick Cheney. When he got up, he said, and please, Jen, Greg Canham and Chris Gallagher, the prosthetics and the makeup people on this, if they hadn't done the job absolutely brilliant, I wouldn't be here. No one would give a crap about it at all. I share this with you gentlemen and the crew as well. Great job. Uh, let's take a look at the, the next uh, slide. Um, Greg, you're working here with, on, uh, on the Dick Cheney character. Um, and tell us a little bit about what you got involved here. And I, know, I believe they're silicone pieces or they're foam rubber pieces. No, it's all silicone. All of it was silicone appliances we had. One on his nose, he has a little divot here, and we filled that in and then rounded his nose off, and he had little plugs he'd put up his nose to widen it a little more. And his top lip was always his, and then he had lower teeth in, 
And when he was older, he wore contacts. But then even when he was young, he had a chin appliance to smooth out his chin. And then it went on with just cheek appliances and a little neck waddle. And then up to uh, where he had full neck, back of the neck, and big cheek appliances and a chin. That's and all? And eye, eye bags. That, that's it? That's, I think, <laughs> Now, I think you mentioned something to me uh, a couple of days ago uh, about something that you did with the, um, with the rubber grease and um, tattoo color, where you mixed it together. Yeah, it's the William Tuttle base rubber mask grease, and I discovered in India that I c accidentally one day mixed uh, the uh, illustrator, liquid illustrator, with the makeup on a sponge, a st I call them white stucco sponges, and because uh, I couldn't get either one of them to fully cover where the piece came down on the appliance on his face in India, and so I started using it a lot now where I go in and, and mix the two and go in and, and uh, go over it. We use uh, airbrush, Chris would go in and airbrush some uh, il illustrator colors and then I go in and touch certain areas up and it really blends, the two of them really blend well but still keeping it very thin. And then I go over at the end with the rubber mask grease to give it a little nice shine and a little trans, very thin, very translucent look to it so you can see through it. And then the last thing is the reds, I go in and punch up all the reds. You did something interesting with, uh, with uh, Baldies, I believe, also. Yes, Chris did that. He, uh, we shot him 21 with his hair, and then once it was in the can, he, they uh, shaved his head every day, and he would shave it and get it down, and then uh, we'd use Pax, Mel Pax paint on it, two, three colors to get it looking like his skin color and everything, and then, uh, Chris would go in and airbrush some baldies, thinned out baldies, so you wouldn't get the hair growth during the day. And it uh, worked fantastic, and the wigs uh, worked really well with it, and it really made it natural looking. Okay. And um, you, you had the different looks here. Let's go back to the 27 and 33 uh, different looks here, and a lot of that those looks were also done with the, uh, with the hair pieces. Uh, and Patty, I think um, y y you were overseeing, but was it uh, Karen, Karen Myers who was applying? Yes. For all of the uh, Christian Bale characters? Yes, uh, Karen did a lot of the application. We both worked t together in the mornings. We'd go over which wigs were working for the day, and it truly was a job that took all hands. We needed four hands for the jobs because once the hair was shaved off, the wigs didn't quite fit as well. <laughs> so we did it. When you go out to the lobby, you can see, especially in the older wigs, uh, there's a lot of little flaps that we had to cut and darts here and there. So one of us would be holding the piece out and the other one would get the brush and the glue in there and quickly mat things down. So it definitely took two people some of the times to do that. Yeah. Karen was just, her work is just so precise, and I knew she was the right person for this job. Great. You can see in these, uh, in these clips here the difference between age 27 and 23, uh, where um, the, the sideburn uh, comes down a little bit further, a mm -hmm. little bit different shape, you know, just subtleties that were there all the way through. Um, and then um, let's take a look at the next clip. Now here we've got him in, in the older look, and, and uh, Greg, you were talking about some of the, the changes here. Uh, so um, just go through briefly, if you would. You've got neck pieces, and I think that neck piece goes all the way around underneath in the back. Yeah, and a big, big piece in the back for the rolls and that, which we didn't decide on until the first day of shooting when we finally put the whole thing on. It was the river shoot. And uh, we just went, he needs the back of the neck. So we hadn't taken a full head cast, so we just took a, kept the neck on and took a, fa a back piece thing and then sculpted and went from there. 
But uh, 35 and 40 was when he got into office, and that's when people started seeing him. When he was young, nobody knew what he looked like. And then as he, of course, got to the famous look and when he was older, 65, 68, uh, when they started, they didn't, nobody thought we could pull this off like this. And uh, they just wanted an essence of Cheney, of course, in, in uh, Christian, like happens with a lot of makeups. And, uh, but as it went along and Christian really got into the prosthetics and everything, we did tests and uh, then he kept pushing, saying a stronger, fatter neck. He was really into a strong neck and he really wanted to just be, you, so you didn't notice him, he just would blend in the background. That's what he really wanted to look like. And so uh, it just progressed to, you know, as myself being a makeup artist, I really wanted to go for it. And uh, luckily, Christian let us go that far, and uh, it just all came together. We had six weeks. That's to great pull it off and it worked. That's great. Let's take a look at the, the next, uh, the next uh, set of film here. Now here we've got uh, Amy at age 43 uh, and Lynn at age 72. And uh, Kate and, and uh, Patty, I know you two were involved uh, together in making some of these changes. Um, let's discuss this older look first. We did the fracture wrap on her, which used to be part of our journeyman test. Remember that? I remember it very well. So it, I learned some I, I also remember seeing this on different actresses that I worked with. Yeah, it's a great technique. If there's hairstylists here that haven't learned this technique, it really does come in handy for someone with the amount of hair that Amy Adams has so that you can make a nice head shape out of it. Also, I learned some great techniques from Renata of how to tighten up areas to ma maybe pull the skin back a little bit, which we used for the early Lynn Cheney. And then this helped us, as Kate will explain, with the lips. Okay, let's, let's go back one. one. Okay, now here, here we've got a nice look, too, of the, uh, the 23 and the 54. And, and uh, Kate, what have we got going here with the with the, the 23 as an example, because she looks so so lovely. Well, Amy's very young looking anyway. She has amazing skin. So what we tried to do, we did use lifts to get this eyebrow shape and also on the neck. And we did all of her makeup up. Everything was on top. All of her eye makeup was on top. Her lips were higher. Um, brows were higher. Just everything was up. And then in the later years, everything was drawn on down lip shape was drawn very, very underneath um, eye makeup. Not in this one so much, but in the later stuff, all the eye makeup was underneath. And then lips again, because it was never discussed publicly that there was this facelift, and it was never mentioned in the script, uh, it would just look weird if we went kind of all the way. So it had to be subtle enough so that it did look like her, but not you know, blatant, because otherwise it would just look weird. But so. But if you look at Lynn Cheney, her eyebrows just kept getting further and further apart. The same way her hairline kept, kept going back, back, back. Mostly during the presidency. So um, uh, at that point, all of her makeup was, uh, the details were all underneath. And the eyebrows got wider and looked worse. Okay. Now here also, um, I believe we've got uh, a great deal of stretch and stipple and uh, also um, a uh, little pliance underneath the, the jawline. Let's go, let's go back to where we were. Yes, uh, I would no, do the no. stipple. For, for Kate. Oh, well, this this it doesn't have the appliance yet. This is just some stretch and stipple. Okay. Um, and this was mostly made because she had daughters uh, who she was actually quite close to in age in real life. In the, uh, the actresses, they were all kind of in the same age range. We kind of had to, in her 40s, age her just to make that age gap between the actresses who were playing teenagers. Mm. So to make that age gap believable, we really had to push her age. So this is just a little bit of stretch and stubble around the eyes and around the mouth. Okay, and then let's let's look uh, two more uh, photos forward. Okay, stop right here. Now here we see you working on on. Um, 
on Lynn Cheney, and we see you working on Condoleezza Rice. Let's go to the next, uh, next slide. Now, this is I interesting. Uh, so we see the Lisa Gay Hamilton. We see Lisa, he, Lisa Gay Hamilton with marks all over her face. And then we see Condoleezza Rice. So I thought it was interesting the, what you had said before about how you sort of create some of the characters. You take a photo and then you, you go in with uh, doing some sketching. And I don't where know you how to go. do Photoshop. So mm. I kind of just draw on there kind of what needs to be done and see what I can do, especially if it's going to be an out of the kit thing. It has to be done it painted. So, and that's what this was. It was. Uh, in my mind, I tried to think before even looking at research pictures, I tried to think of what were those triggers of Condoleezza Rice that I know as her being an iconic figure. See, Lynn Cheney wasn't really known to the general public as much as she was. So I kind of thought gap in the teeth and a furrowed brow. Um, and then went and did the research. And so I knew that those were the things that I really had to get. And of course, Lisa Gay is so smooth mm -hmm. and so, tons and tons of layers of stretch and stipple and glued her eyelids down uh, to make that hooded eyelid. So it kind of glued them with telesis and put stretch and stipple all over them and just made them as heavy and heavy as possible. And then um, her, Lisa Gay's nose was much wider. So uh, I took third degree silicone and closed her nostrils to make just their nostrils look much, much smaller stretch and stipple all over and then figured out how to, well, asking advice from Tony G and then Bill Corso, how to do those little uh, raised uh, freckles, little skin tag freckles. And um, it was a really thickened bondo with eyeshadow over it. Right. Well, there were so many historic characters. We've got Steve Carell as Donald Rumsfeld. We've got uh, Tyler Perry as Colin Powell. We've got Hot damn George W. Bush Jamie <laughs> by Jamie Kelman, uh, Osama bin Laden, and so many other characters. Uh, really uh, an amazing job. Let's see one more. Uh, here we've got a, a group shot of uh, some of the group. And uh, uh, Patty was off uh, creating some wonderful wig there. Uh, so thank you very much <laughs> for being here. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Of course, and three other planes are unaccounted for. I'm seeing five planes unaccounted for. Mr. Vice President, POTUS on line one, sir. Mr. President, <clears throat> the situation is uh, extremely fluid. I strongly recommend you stay in the air. This can be a great opportunity, an opportunity to work in the hallways of decision-making in the most powerful country in the goddamn world. I believe I may have a way to put an oar in the water on Russia. What if we create... Mr. President. Hold on, Henry. Let's hear Dick out. One of Dick Cheney's special superpowers was the ability to make the most wild and extreme ideas sound measured and professional. But much more enjoyable. Hmm. I do like a good puppet show. I say we do it. I will not let you down. You can count on me. Uh, and uh, thank you. I do believe I have to go to the, the hospital now. been a while in the last year. Foreign policy sessions. That's right, yeah, that's right. 
Those meetings were uh, very engaging. I, I do remember we both agreed my dad would have been reelected had he taken out Saddam. Right. Yeah, wartime presidents. Very popular. Two times. Two times! I have to drag you out of that jail like a filthy hobo. I'm sorry, Lynn. What? What did you just say? I'm sorry, Lenny. You're sorry? Don't call me Lenny. You're sorry. One time is I'm sorry. Two times makes me think that I've picked the wrong man. You already got your ass thrown out of Yale for drinking and fighting. And now you're just gonna be a lush that hangs power lines for the state? Are you gonna live in a trailer? We're gonna have 10 kids? Is that the plan? Flaming baton trick, and Dick would wait backstage with a bucket of water, so I'm at the state finals, and I throw up the baton, and it doesn't come down. <laughs> Shady! Oh, where did you find it her? Brussels, please. <clears throat> you need to remember, Lizzie, that if you have power, people will always try to take it from you, always. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Remember that. Donald Rumsfeld, please. This is a tragedy. That is our president. This is a ridiculous. I actually think this could be very, very good news. Dick was becoming sharper and sharper as a DC insider. And Lynn had started to write articles and explore ideas for her first novel. Dick. Dick. Then, she received news from back home in Casper. There was never a serious investigation into Lynn's mom's death. You want to see me do a handstand right here? Oh. I can do it right here. Don't. Dad, Dad. You're getting so pretty. She broke up with me. Mom, Dad. I like girls. I'm gay. It doesn't matter, sweetheart. We love you no matter what. The vice president is a nothing job. How many steps ahead was he looking? How did he feel about the opportunity that was in front of him? There are certain moments so delicate, like a teacup <laughs> and saucer, stacked on a teacup and saucer, on a teacup and saucer. Can you change your my way? I sense that uh, you're a kinetic leader. You make decisions based on instinct. Maybe I can uh, handle some of the more mundane jobs, overseeing uh, bureaucracy, managing military uh, energy, uh, foreign policy. That sounds good. That looks like a second play. Let's get him out. Play ahead of the White House at this moment. We have less than a minute to get to the security ground bunker. Let's go! Move! 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 is being evacuated, we're told, and uh, clearly that, that shot that uh, we have on our screen now, this is the Pentagon just across the river from Washington, D.C. I need you to take me to Dick. The CIA and their international coalition toppled the Taliban and took Afghanistan in a matter of weeks. Cheney had found something much more powerful than missiles or jet planes. A focus group show people still aren't sure about a connection between Saddam and Al Qaeda. And uh, France and Germany have both said that they will not join our coalition, and neither will Israel. Zarqawi went to meet bin Laden in Afghanistan. Did he or did he not meet with Al-Qaeda? But Zarqawi 
had vowed to kill all Shia Muslims, and bin Laden's mother was Shia. So the meeting didn't go over well. Iraq today harbors a deadly terrorist network headed by Abu Musab al-Zakawi, an associate and collaborator. How's UN address was seen by millions of Americans, but other people were watching as well. Collaborator of Osama bin Laden and his al-Qaeda lieutenants. Zakawi's activities are not The great general of America saying his name over and over again immediately made Zarqawi a star. Staying in the capital. President wants you to step down. I appreciate your service. Don? Well, does uh, Bush's kid want me out or do you? I can't win every fight, Don. You were a little piece of shit. Wow, how did you become such a cold son of a bitch? I'm sorry, Don. Your heart just isn't pumping enough oxygen to keep your vital organs alive. Should I call for a minister? No. No, he's not going anywhere. Okay, Dad. Dick Cheney, you are not going anywhere, do you hear me? So, don't you care what the American people think? No, uh, I think you uh, cannot be uh, blown off course. <clears throat> I can feel your recriminations and your judgment, and I am fine with it. You want to be loved, go be a movie star. You chose me, and I did what you asked. Ask all of our nominees to please come back on the stage. Let's give them another round of applause. As we start our, our question and answer period, uh, there are um, individuals in the aisle and they have microphones. So if you are, have a question that you want to ask, please raise your hand. They'll bring the microphone over uh, so that everybody can hear what your question is. Uh, so uh, I'm going to start off just with a, a, a question. Um, such great work. Jeez, how do you ask a question? <laughs> um, I was very much taken with um, Elizabeth in uh, Mary Queen of Scots um, with the sort of pockmark look that was done. What, what, would, what did you use for that? Scarring stage, we had uh, silicon cheeks, um, and and we also had pre bondo molds as well, and uh, um, yeah, they were just and and obviously that was then painted up white as well for the uh, when she covered her pot marks. Okay, question from the audience. Here, I have one. We have a, a question. Uh, Hello. Hi. Sorry. Over here. Um, first of all, congratulations to all of you for the nomination. Um, so my question is about uh, the final effect of a makeup look is dependent on many other factors of the film. So for instance, lighting, angles, editing, all of those things. So I wanted to basically ask, how is your process of working with all these other departments, if there is any, and where are the challenges that you possibly face? Uh, it doesn't have to be about the specific movie that you have been nominated for. It can be just in your career and experience in general. Thank you. Well, I think I'll take that just because it's sort of a, a general, general question. Um, ideally, you want to have a great collaboration between makeup, hairstyling, costume, um, cinematography, um, because as many of, of you know, um, if the lighting is incorrect, um, it can make somebody look older 
And if you're trying to make somebody look older and the lighting is incorrect, it could make them look younger. Uh, so it's, uh, it's certainly something that has to ideally be a collaboration, and when you have that collaboration, then, then it, uh, it all works together. Another question. Does this elaborate makeup have to be uh, put on and taken off every day for a period of weeks? Well, we shot for, I mean, I think it was about 50 times we did the makeup, and a lot of days we'd have to do two makeups because of the, the location. We'd need to do a younger makeup and then the older makeup. It, it was different all the time, but a lot of days we would completely take them out of one makeup and put them into another makeup. And it was many hours of day, of course, then, but uh, it was the only way to do it, and you have to do it. It takes you know, whatever length it takes to do it right. We had several people working on them at a time, and but it, you just have to do it as fast as you can and do it. Okay, another question. So I think that the, 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 the just paraphrasing that, sorry to chime in, that basically, yes, you don't reuse pieces. If uh, there was a, that part to your question, you don't reuse pieces unless, you know, you really have to and then you really don't want to because they look dreadful. You might be able to pop them on a double way up there on a mountain, but you don't want to do a close-up on it. <laughs> so. another I have question. another question here. Hi, congratulations on your nomination. I hope you all win. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to ask you, uh, have you ever had a case where actors develop an allergy to makeup and they have to keep on wearing it? Who wants to jump on that one? I mean, I have. Uh, a lot of people are allergic to old age stipple, which is made from latex. And I've been in the middle of the film Anthony Mackie in Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter. Lois got to do the real Abraham Lincoln <laughs> Spielberg, but I did the... <laughs> but halfway through the film, uh, the spots and everything I was doing in the areas of the stipple, he just, a rash, red. And so uh, luckily it was towards the end and I just had to completely switch over to uh, theatrical makeup, painting it all and making it look the same with paint. Anybody else with a problem like that? Yeah, I can't imagine we all haven't had it. Kate? <laughs> yes, on sharp objects. Um, it might have been Amy's and my hastily trying to remove those words from her arms. And then we removed the word. And the next day she came in, that word was still there. But there was no makeup there. <laughs> uh, so we were a little bit more gentle the next time. Okay, going back to the question before about you know the uh, the uh, appliances and can you use it over? Um, as careful as you are in putting the appliance on, you're just as careful in taking the appliance off because you're going to be using that skin for days after days. So, another question. I have a question over here. Hi, are there any specific? makeup brands that cover up surgical scars for actors? Band-Aids. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anybody have an answer for that? Well, there, I mean, I'll have a go at that if you like. I mean, the, 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 the thicker makeup, um, Dermacol, actually, derma palettes were originally created specifically as a camouflage palette for medical use or medical associated use, you know, whether it was a birthmark or scarring. So, yes, there are. Um, we're not about to tout one brand over another up here, not unless we get an awful lot of money to do so. <laughs> but, no, seriously, no, we can't do that. But, yeah, but yes, there are, yes. That liquid bandage we've used yeah, a lot right. when things happen. I've been on a show where the actor, instead of letting me touch up the dirt, grabbed a handful near the tree and went like this and then uh, poison ivy oh. on his forehead. And then mm -hmm. they go, you have to cover it. And I go, I ain't <coughs> touching it. Uh. You take him to a doctor, you do whatever. I am not touching it. 
and I wouldn't because it can get infected or whatever, you know. Okay, another question. I have another question over here. Hi. Um, oh, wow, that's loud. Uh, <laughs> First off, congratulations uh, on your nominations. And uh, my question is, what is the hardest and most elaborate makeup look you've ever done? This is for whoever feels like answering it. The, the films they just yeah. did. Uh, for me, uh, Robert Downey Jr. and Fur. And what was involved in that makeup? He played somebody who had hypertrichosis or hirsutism, co so covered head to toe in hair. A circus sideshow performer. Anybody else that had an unusually difficult one, even more difficult than well, what you've done on, on these I three always films. say the hardest one I've ever done was Sigourney Weaver in Alien 3. She had shot and shaved her head down to stubble and uh, they needed to do the new ending and everything. And I go, I don't know, I've never done this before. And I don't think anybody had. And I, we did a thin, and we only had foam rubber then, and we did a thin, thin bald cap out of latex. And Stuart Ardingstall spent uh, 12, 12, two weeks, 10 hours a day punching each hair into it. And then I would shave it down to stubble and have to go in and thicken it a bit and trying to get, and she had really thick hair that had grown out and she didn't want to shave it. And it took me an hour and a half just to get her hair down with gaff quat and gantres. And it was the hardest, trying to line it up here really thin and make it work was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Anyone else with a major accomplishment? Okay, another question. I have a question over here. Thank you, hi. I have a question for my fellow Swede, Göran. Uh, what did you use for the prosthetics? What material did you use? Oh, for border? Yes. Uh, well, we, we usually use Platzil, uh, but for this one I wanted to try, because Platzil has some issues depending on where in the face you put it. Um, you can get little crinkling uh, around the mouth especially. So for this one we put, um, I used gelatin for the chin. I started like that and see if that worked. And then um, Eva really liked it, our actress. Um, so I felt maybe we should try it for the cheeks as well. So we actually have a mix of silicon forehead, silicon nose and gelatin cheeks and gelatin chin, which is kind of rare today. But it, it did help with that problem, but you always get another problem if you use another material. So because of the cold, I heard that it was one day, wasn't it? We had a problem because gelatin softens with the body heat, but when it's cold, it stiffens. Yeah, we had this one day um, at, during the sex scene that was really cold. Um, and obviously there was so much sort of touching and rubbing, biting. Um, it was quite tricky, but then for the day, for the days where we were in the water, I ordered silicon pieces because gelatin in the water can be tricky. <laughs> All right, another question. I have another one. <coughs> You're all so wonderful, and at the top of your field, it's a real honor to be here with you today. So thank you so much for all the art that you've brought to the movies that we love. I have a general question though, because you are at the top of your field. Do you find that when you have your concept for a movie, that that concept and vision is accepted pretty much across the board, or do you still have times where you find you have to compromise quite a bit? Jenny, you wanna jump on that one? Um, yes, I, I, I normally find if I have a concept for a movie, and it is completely right and just in my mind of the way I should be doing it, then I feel I could fight off any director or producer <laughs> to accept my concept. And um, I haven't failed so far, so. <laughs> Kate, what about you? Uh, I don't know if I've had the same experience as you. <laughs> yeah. I've, I'm, 
I think I'm just a real slow learner. Um, I feel like I never get a character until like two weeks into the movie. <laughs> and uh, I've been lucky enough to have very collaborative directors and costume designers, production designers and hairstylists and actors. So it's always an ongoing process. Um, I mean, I got to hand it to people who do TV. I am a fish out of water because I can never come up with something that fast. So for me, it's a long-term collaboration. Urin? No, I don't think I have anything like that. Okay. No, I don't really do, like, this is an exceptional film for me because I don't really do a, a full design job for a film. So I don't really have to, you know, fight for my ideas like that. Okay. And uh, Greg, I know that uh, you often have changes after changes and tests, or maybe not tests, and maybe it changes during the movie. Yeah, and I always have done what I want. <laughs> I don't care what the director or... Exactly. <laughs> because they usually have no concept of anything. Yeah. <laughs> so I go in and I design what I want, and then they, they've almost always have gone, oh, that's great, perfect. And I go, thanks, you know. <laughs> but like Coppola, Dracula, he, I would show him three different heads for the wolf creature, and he, he goes, I know nothing about makeup effects. You do whatever you want. So I would choose everything, and I... That's the kind of director we want for all the time, isn't it? <laughs> okay, we've got, we've got time for one more question. i got a question over here. Uh, congratulations on your nominations. Uh, my question is uh, sort of more technical. I have two questions, so I'm just going to ask it combined. Um, with the heavier pieces for the prosthetics, um, is there anything like an option for the actors to get any time to practice with them, to like work on their emoting or anything like that? And secondly, um, how did you get the silicone pieces to survive in water for border? Thank you. So the silicone pieces, they survive fine in water. That's not a problem. Um, um, that's why it's more tricky with the gelatin. but. Um, it's been fine for the rest of the shoot. Um, what was the first part of the question? <laughs> rehearsal time. Oh, rehearsal time. Uh, I think that's different. I, I don't know if we had any, because mm -hmm. you, you basically... I handed that's over the makeup two days before <laughs> we started shooting, so I don't think Eva got any time to rehearse for this one, but... That's oh, you did? Oh, that uh, we did it. Yeah, we test test filming once. Yeah, but it's not usually a lot of rehearsal time. At least not my experience. I don't know if Greg works on bigger budget movies than I do, so he might <laughs> might have more time. I don't know. Uh, well, we try. I mean, there's people like Gary Oldman. I when I did uh, uh, Hannibal, and I never saw him rehearse. I never saw him rehearse in the bat creature suit and he just gets out there and does it and I'd just be oh, you know amazing how he would just instinctively do it never saw him but like Christian we would make him up days at his house and he'd just spend the day in it in front of mirrors and that and then he was always working on it in the mirror when we'd be making him up he'd just the research and watching Janie and then practicing and it was really fascinating to get to see him learn all that with his character so but usually we don't have time much to do <laughs> rehearsing with makeups okay wonderful wonderful work from all of you this year just just outstanding <laughs>